Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Quinney, and this is the Flames Faceoff, brought to you by the Hockey Writers. Uh, now, we're a weekly show where we bring together our top writers in the Calgary Flames writing pool, and we discuss all things Flames. Now, to make sure you don't miss an episode, you can follow us on YouTube and uh, uh, subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, like this video on YouTube and Facebook, and do be sure to share it with your friends and fellow Calgary Flam Flames uh, fans. Um, you can also listen to the show now. If you can't handle our handsome faces here, you can also handle, uh, watch the show or listen to the show as a podcast. Just the easiest way is to go to the uh, Hockey Writers uh, Podcast Network and download us on iHeartRadio or any other platform that you uh, care to use. And do be sure to check out some of the great hockey content that we have here at thehockeywriters.com. So with that, let's get going. I'd like to introduce the panel. And this week, I'm pleased to announce that we have a new panelist. Uh, there he is, Mr. Mike Wilson. Welcome, Mike. Thank you for having me, everybody. Yeah, um, Mike, uh, just uh, you know, warm welcome to you. And uh, we'd uh, like you to tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, inquiring minds are want going to want to know what a nice guy like you, uh, how you ended up on a panel like this. Uh, and I guess tell us uh, a bit about your writing interests and uh, what we could expect to see from you going forward with what you write. Well, this is a pretty clean crew compared to what I usually <laughs> what I usually hang out with down at the Dome. So um, it's all good. Um, yeah, I'm a Flames writer. I'm born and raised in Calgary. Um, I contribute over at Flames Nation, and I'm also the co-host of the In the Dome podcast. Um, you've probably heard me over there rambling a lot. Um, I'm really into analytics. I do a lot of uh, writing on on analytics and player breakdown, stuff like that. So I will take any chance I can get to talk Calgary Flames hockey, and I will talk about it all day, every day, 24 hours a day. So here, here I am. I'm stoked to be uh, covering the Flames for the hockey writers here. Great stuff. We're, re we're really pleased to have you with us, Mike. Um, and we have with us also Mr. Greg Tuzowski. Welcome, Greg. How are things? Well, I'm fresh off the golf course and uh, just barely made it on time. I hit join meeting. So I'm, uh, I'm, I prepped for the show by uh, hitting a 42 on the front and a 41 on the back. That's not bad. It's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. So you <laughs> haven't given up on your dreams of a, a spot in the tour then, eh? Champions Tour, senior senior <laughs> tour. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, and with that now. great big beautiful uh, Calgary Flames hat, we have Brett Kroos. Welcome, Brett. How are you? I'm uh, doing well. I also just got back. I did a six rounds of golf in the past six days with a uh, couple of my buddies, so uh, nice. we had a good time. But uh, now it's time for hockey talk. Yeah, but you're not sharing any of your scores here on this. Oh, uh, uh, Absolutely not. Or how many balls I lost. All right. All right. All right. That's a uh, safe, safe policy, Brett. So I got to so, brag about my golf. I hit a, I sunk a couple birdies yesterday at dog pound. So see, Ooh, see, that's nice. Uh, Paul Quinney, you're up. Come on, buddy. You got to get this, uh, a golf ball right now. I'm, I'm the, a poster child for duffer. Yeah, you look me up in the dictionary a duffer. I'll, you'll see my picture there, but uh, no, I'm not shooting any scores down in the eighties and very few birdies, but. Anyway, I'll be sure, Mike, if I'm out uh, in Alberta, not to place any money down on any game that I play with you. Yeah, <laughs> you, you better not, man. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll show you the ropes on these local Calgary courses. <laughs> okay, let's get, uh, I mean, it is the dog days of summer, and I thought, uh, not much is happening here. What are we going to talk about? But you know what? There's, there's a fair amount to talk about. Um, I thought we'd um, maybe kick it off with a discussion or a discussion around uh, the captaincy for the flames and uh, ask who could be captain next season. Now Colton, our very own Colton Pankew of the hockey writers and, and this uh, show uh, wrote an article uh, entitled flames have numerous options for uh, team captain next season. Uh, I'd like to kind of pull you guys. Uh, does anybody stick out for you as an obvious choice for uh, team captain? Uh, Mike, let's start with you. Well, I know Colton said they have numerous options, but I think he was being uh, he was being nice because to me, there's really only one clear cut option, and it is Matthew Kachuk. I know this topic has sparked a lot of controversy debate in the city amongst the fan base, whether or not he's ready, ready, whether or not he's too hot headed, 
yada, yada, yada. I think Matthew Kachuk, whether he's been wearing a letter, whether he has been considered part of the leadership group over the past five years, has so clearly been the leader of this team night in and night out. There's nobody who's dragging this team into the battle every single night other than Matthew Kachuk. If you really want to have a slam dunk change in direction, which the Flames have kind of indicated they do. I mean, they just let their captain go. They, they, they want to affect change in some manner. I, I think the best way to do that is to hand the captaincy over to a guy who <laughs> I think would not only relish it, but do much better, would come off a season where he struggled a little bit and would improve. If he's given more responsibility, he's going to be even better. So mm -hmm. I think for me and for a lot of people, Kachuk is the clear, obvious slam dunk. Yes, give it to him right now. Give it to him last year choice. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, you'd have a lot of Calgary fans that, that would agree with that point of view, Mike. Uh, Greg, uh, what's your take on it? Would you go with Kachuk? Uh, there are some downsides to him. What's, uh, what's your take? Well, I know we've talked a bit about this year and previous shows that it's been a down year for him. And um, there's been some chatter about how the flames kind of didn't back him up when he had that bottle flipping incident and he was mad slamming doors and people didn't really come to his defense. And I think, uh, you know, according to the rumors, there was some talk in the room that they were telling him to like cool his jets and kind of dial it back a bit, because I think, I think the quote was something like it, it can't always be a, a riot or something like that at the end of the game. So, so I think that kind of hurt him a little bit in some people's eyes, but um, in the end, I'm kind of with Mike in the extent that they should make a decision because when the uh, Vegas Golden Knights waited like three or four years, to name a captain having this, you know, just four guys wearing the A, it just, to me, it doesn't, uh, that doesn't sit well with me. Like maybe one year you do that, but I'm hoping that the flames kind of do pick uh, Kachuk as the captain. There are other options, like, you know, Michael Backlund's the longest serving flame and he's wearing an A for a long time, but um, he's really the only other person who might ha have a shot at it. But, you know, I think Kachuk is the right choice and um, I hope they pick him instead of having, you know, no captain because that is a big, big possibility of having no captain this year. And uh, I'm not a big fan of that. Yeah. Brett, what's your take? Uh, neither uh, Mike nor, nor Greg seem to be concerned about the, his, his, the length of his contract, he's coming up, I think it's next year as an RFA. Do you, would you want to nail him down to a long-term future before you appointed him captain or what would you do? Um, I, yeah, I think you, you can go to captaincy right away. I mean, he shows emotion on the ice, off the ice. I mean, at the press conferences, he's always, uh, you know, kind of beating himself up, but taking in sort of taking responsibility kind of uh, way. So I, I think I agree with Mike. I think that just kind of sets the tone for where you're kind of headed with your organization by handing the captaincy over to the, a 23 year old on your team, who's arguably probably one of your best players, if not the best on the team. And I absolutely think he has a bounce back um, season this season. Um I mean, it's big shoes to fill after Giordano and Aguinla the past 15 years. Um, but I think that's the kind of guy who could absolutely step up into that role and, you know, have a bounce back season and, and lead this team. But I don't really see anybody else. Maybe I think Backlund is probably another obvious choice, maybe. But other than that, the rest just don't really make too much sense. And I agree with Greg that I think no captain could definitely be a way that they also go this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, any concerns though? Uh, do you want to sign to Chuck to a three or four year deal, get some tenure uh, longevity to him before you appoint him captain? Would that be a factor? I think appointing him captain kind of helps you sign him in, in okay. that sense. That's going to get him on board because I mean, if you're Matthew Kachuk right now, do you really have that much incentive to sign as it is? Nobody really knows where the flames are going to be next year, let alone two or three years down the road when he's hitting the prime of his career. If they're looking, if, if they're projecting to be kind of like a middling in out bubble team, like I don't see why Kachuk has that much incentive to stay for himself if he's not named the captain. So it's probably a scenario where you are giving him the captaincy as a vote of confidence and as, okay, you are the guy for the next five, six, seven years. You are the centerpiece of our team. We're going to build around you and bring in what you need. So I think in that sense, it's more of a reverse engineering type thing. Um, 
I mean, obviously I, I think Kachuk is a great player and I know some people are kind of down on him after this past year, but it, the sooner, the better in terms of getting locked up for, for a long term, as far as I'm concerned. So um, yeah. I think given the captaincy first and then use that as an incentive to, to sign him long term would be my take on that. All right. Well, this is a great segment, gentlemen. We're all pretty clear. It's Matthew to Chuck. So uh, it'll make for a panel. Oh, I don't know. Maybe in October or something. <laughs> we're either explain how, how, uh, what clairvoyance we were or uh, trying to explain the flames going in a different direction, but uh, good stuff. Um, I'd like to switch gears now uh, a little bit um, to uh, team management. The question is, is, uh, is Brad for a living? Is he done making moves this summer? It's been pretty quiet. Uh, much less, I think it's fair to say, has happened than a lot of people wanted to, to happen. Uh, arguably, they've improved the the uh, uh, front, uh, the forward cores. They've taken a step backward on the D line. Uh, has the team gotten any better, uh, Greg? Uh, what What are your thoughts on that? Um, and the reason I'm going to you first, actually, is you wrote a great article. Flames fans are hoping for major roster moves before the season starts. Uh, and you, you based it on a poll of social media. So can you just tell us briefly uh, how you researched the article and uh, what do fans, fans think has Trey Living delivered uh, what Calgary fans wanted to see this summer? Well, I did. I think what I describe as a highly un, uh, unscientific poll, like it's uh, whenever you kind of poll fans, uh, you're you're kind of getting the diehard fans who who really want to talk about the Flames. You know, like you're not getting the full picture, obviously. But I I put a couple I, like five questions onto a couple of pretty popular Flames fans. Uh, uh, pages on Facebook and I got like hundreds of responses and wow. it's funny one of the one of my things was you know like do nothing we're, we're good to go and I think I, I could count on one hand how many votes that thought it was like less than one percent you know like uh, a vast majority of fans that I polled are looking you know they, they want to you know like a top six forward but probably they're talking about Jack Eichel and you know, like a lot of them you know, still wanted a, a second, you know, another defenseman, you know, I asked for all of the above, you know, like, you know, asked for another backup goalie. And some people said they wanted everything, you know, but um, 70% said they want another top six forward. And, and to me, they're probably talking about Jack Eichel because uh, the Flames did add a pretty good piece in this off season with Coleman. So um, I, I think fans are kind of tired of this kind of this middling kind of, um, approach to the flames uh off season there uh it, it, every every year we've had kind of this tinkering this keep the same core and you know and let's kind of add and subtract a couple of pieces but it hasn't worked you know like the flames have made the playoffs four times in the last seven season and i said in my article like that's the definition of a middling franchise like that is that that's not a great franchise but they're not crappy either they're just, they're just kind of just sitting there in the middle barely making the playoffs or barely missing them so so for sure, I think fans want more, and I don't. I want. I want to see more. I want to see a, an, another couple of deals made this summer because uh, I want this team to be exciting. I want this team to, you know, win more games. I would love. Uh, I would love to see a big shakeup, but you know, I don't really see it happening. <laughs> like they, uh, they, I said in my article that the option do nothing is probably the most likely scenario that's going to come out of this summer. So, yeah, I hope I'm wrong. Mike, what's your take? Has this team gotten any better with the moves that Trey Living's made, made so far? I mean, are, are they closer to being a contender? Well, I think you have to peel it back a little bit to the time when Daryl Sutter was hired and took over as coach, because that's when I really think this, this rendition of the team kind of starts and needs to be judged in earnest. So if, if you kind of pull it back to that with the premise that, Kate, okay, this will be Daryl Sutter's first full season behind the bench, with some additions who play very Daryl Sutter type hockey, they're, they're probably better, right? Mm -hmm. I think the flames are counting on the Daryl Sutter factor to be the Barry trots in New York factor where the flames individually are better than the sum of their parts because Daryl Sutter's system works well. And I mean, we saw that to a degree last year after he took over, they were much improved defensively. They were playing really good hockey. The results quite weren't there yet, but I mean, if there, if that's an 82 game season season, I think the flames are absolutely making the playoffs at the very least. So I think the flames are probably counting on Daryl Sutter to be enough, whether or not he will be enough is I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical because I mean, 
you look at the additions, does adding Blake Coleman and Tyler Pitlick and Trevor Lewis, do, do those get you any closer to like beating the Colorado Avalanche in a seven game series or beating the Vegas Golden Knights? I mean, no. Are you are you are you any closer to contending in the in the West with with those additions? I mean, you're probably better, but you're still not where you should be after seven seasons of Bradtree living, doing a like great talking about tinkering all the time. So they're probably yeah. better, but again, it's, it's marginally better. And it's probably more coming from the coach than the actual players on the ice. Yeah. Okay. Brett, uh, what's your take? Are we going to see, do, do they need to make some more big moves? I mean, so far uh, there, there haven't been, um, you know, the big acquisitions and by big, as Greg alluded to it, they're talking about Tarasenko or a Jack Eichel that hasn't happened. And then some of the big trades uh, go still with the team, Monahan still with the team. Uh, are they doing enough? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, we had that discussion there a couple of weeks ago that they, they should push all their chips into the middle and make that big move. Um, Cause I just don't think you sure you probably make the playoffs this year and then the week Pacific, but you know, like Mike said, do you really get past Colorado? Do you really get past Vegas? Um, so I think they, like they brought in guys like Pitlick and, you know, Lewis is a door of guys who are all defense first, which will, you know, <clears throat> work in Sutter style hockey, but then you you're also depending on a lot of things like a bounce back season from Anderson and, most of the forwards, if, you know, they don't do anything. So, I mean, usually in the past seasons, they've spent pretty much right to the cap and they have 6 million sitting around with just Dylan Dubé left and a couple of minor leaguers to sign. So I kind of wonder if there's, they're trying to do something, but I, yeah, once again, would not be shocked to see them go with this lineup and just, you know, kind of see how they fare in the first part of the season. Yeah. Well, I think the only thing you can get a little excited about would be, um, would be Blake Coleman and, and Mike, you wrote a piece. Uh, Blake Coleman is, is a perfect fit for the flames. Uh, what do you say in that article? And uh, do you, do you think he's going to make that much of a difference? Yeah. You know, because I, when the Coleman signing was announced, I think everybody who has followed the flames as a flames fan had like night sweats. They were remembering, Oh, Troy Brower and James Neal. And like, now we're <laughs> stuck with Lucic. And it's just like this, we've seen this scenario play out more than twice and play out poorly more than twice. So you, you can't not be concerned about, uh, about a huge UFA acquisition who's closer to 30 than he probably should be for, for making that much money. So you can't not be concerned about it. But when you do break it down and look at the type of game that Blake Coleman plays right now in the present for what the Flames are trying to do, it's a, it's a slam dunk fit. I think he'll be great here. Like I said, this team is, is doubling down on the Daryl Sutter type of hockey. And I mean, I don't know if there's a, a player available in the league this season who exemplifies that more than Blake Coleman. Mm -hmm. He's Sutter. He's a Sutter type through and through. And I mean, when I say that, I mean, the flames are probably going to try to be one of the best five on five play driving teams in the league this year under Daryl Sutter. That's always been his MO when he was in LA, those Kings teams were just possession monsters. They would own the puck five on five and would give up very little. I mean, that's Blake Coleman's that, that's Blake Coleman's game to a T. Every time he's on the ice at five on five, he's pushing the play up the other way. So I, I yeah. think that elite play driving is probably the number one reason the Flames identified him as a target and why he'll be a great fit. And I mean, you, you look at you look at how Tampa Bay used this guy. He was used he the the way the Lightning used him created such favorable matchups for guys like Kutrov and Braden Point that it just allowed the Lightning to create just fits for other teams. They could go up, throw the Coleman, Yanni Gord, Barkley Goudreau line against other teams' top lines and not only shut them down, but score goals the other way. So all I can think is, oh, I can't wait to watch Blake Coleman, Andre Mangiapane, and Michael Backlund go head-to-head -head against Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl and keep them in their own end all night. Like, whew, that, that, that sounds like a great proposition to me. So Co Coleman's two-way game combined with his elite shutdown prowess is just that's going to, that's going to reap so many benefits for the flames heading into next season. Um, I know some people are a little concerned about his goal scoring or, or lack thereof. Like, I mean, if you take a look at his box stats, it's not like he's lighting up the league. He's, he's not the acquisition that 
jumps off the page of you like maybe Tyler Toffoli would have been last year or or just like a, to really go to the extreme of Jack Eichel where it's like, wow, this guy's a slam dunk top six goal scoring machine. But if you look at his scoring rates over the past two years, he's right up there with guys like Braden Point, guys like Nikita Kucherov. And again, like I said, he's doing that playing against top quality competition. He's scoring a lot of goals in the time he's given against other teams, top players. So I think he's got a lot of, a lot of goal scoring ability that's untapped. And I mean, you put, you play him higher up in the lineup, you put him with a guy like Andre Mangiapane, you're going to see a lot more goal scoring from Blake Coleman. So in that sense, he's great. And I mean, just from a tactical point of view, I kind of touched on this briefly with, with him being such a great play driver. The guy is a great four checker. We saw the Flames under Sutter last year really shift the way they generated offense into into a, a forward group that generates offense by retrieving the puck, working the cycle, working the puck out front of the net. Blake Coleman's great on the boards. Great Coleman. Blake Coleman's a great four checker. He's tenacious in all three zones. He's fast in all three zones. I just see this being at least for a year or two a match made in heaven with with Daryl Sutter. And like I said, you, you throw that Manji Pani backland. Uh, Coleman trio out like that, that excites me more than anything this season. So sure. There's contract concerns. It's probably a little too old. It's definitely way too long. It's probably too much money in the long term. but for a couple years here, based on what the flames are trying to do, it's such a slam dunk that you yeah. can't help but get excited about it. And I think well, he does fill that top six need. Yeah. He's going to be fun to watch. And as you point out, he, he's another example of how Sutter's putting, uh, putting stamp on this team. Um, Greg, uh, what you're thinking should uh, are you afraid that maybe the current roster as it stands now is the one we're going to go with uh, on October 16th when opening night in Edmonton? I mean, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering as are others, what's out there in the way of deals that can be had? What's your, what's your take? You know, I, um, I think the flames, they've been rumored to be in, in the Jack Eichel, you know, sweepstakes for weeks and weeks, but, uh, and, and nothing seems to be happening on any end. Like I've been hearing nothing that's really moving. And yeah. I think that's actually a good thing for the flames. I think the longer it drags out, I think the weaker the position is for Buffalo because they're kind of losing their advantage perhaps. But, um, in the end, I just don't get the feeling that Calgary is the best fit and, and that the, the Buffalo will go with Calgary. So I, I really don't, I, I wouldn't count Eichel in, in the lineup. And so I'm, I'm kind of hoping that maybe they shore up the defense a little bit more because um, they did add the big Russian, you know, and he's, I look forward to seeing a six, six foot six guy out there who can really hit, you know, kind of, like I'm looking forward to that, but is he a really a, a, a top, you know, top two pairing guy? Maybe he might be on this team, but wouldn't it be great if he could play in the third pairing, you know, and, uh, and we could get maybe some other veteran D man to kind of fill in, I'm, there's not that many out there who are still left for for defensemen, yeah. but um, I still wouldn't mind a, another top four defenseman. You know, like that's that might be more uh, realistic for Flames fans. You know, because I really don't know if if Eichel's coming our way. It, it, I don't really get the sense that that's going to happen. So I think the forward lines might be set. You know, and I, I agree with Mike to the extent that if they use uh, Backlund as a center for Coleman and, and Manjapani, like that's probably one of the best kind of two-way shutdown lines you're going to see. You know, I, I just hope they don't put, like, Monaghan on a line with Coleman and Manjapani because I don't think that's really the best use of his, his talents at this point. So, yeah, I think – look forward to maybe an, another D-man, but I think the forward lines – we could be looking at the opening of night roster for the Flames, looking at those yeah. forward lines right now. And I just yeah. want to jump in on the Monaghan thing. Like, I think that is kind of the linchpin in all of this, is like, well, what do you do with Sean Monaghan? Because I think if the Flames could trade him, they would, but mm -hmm. apparently they can't. So he, I think, I think Monahan is kind of holding up probably a few deals that they they would probably like to make. Hmm. I agree hmm. with that. Brett, to get you to weigh in on that, which uh, any any thoughts on Monahan? Is he is he the stumbling block to uh, or the thing they've got to address before they can get some movement? And uh, yeah, big time. I think you know <clears throat> he had a not great season at all last year and so it's going to be very hard now to trade him uh kind of at the price he's at um so yeah i've you know i've seen fans sort of speculate three-way deals where monahan goes to another team in order to facilitate people coming to calgary but i 
I think I kind of agree with Greg. I'm not sure it's a fit. I think there's just other teams that have, you know, better pieces. I'm not sure our prospects, you know, really get it done unless you're giving away like Zeri and Coronado on top of whatever else you have to give away um, for Eichel. So I, you always like to ask if we're, if we're gambling men here, Paul. And so I, if I'm a gambling man, I'm saying that this is the roster we see uh, the flames open with, unless, you know, something changes drastically in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah. If they are trying to trade Monaghan, you know, maybe then there's a, a huge shakeup, but I just kind of get that feeling that they're, hoping for some rebound seasons from some guys you know Monaghan was once again injured so maybe they're thinking they can get a bounce back season from him or maybe the Monaghan on a line with Coleman and Mangiapane is what's going to spark him is the thought you know from uh, the flames but um, yeah I'm kind of in the sense that I think this is this is the lineup we see and maybe they bring in some uh, a Michael Stone type of signing, maybe even Michael Stone himself, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of going with this lineup for uh, October. Well, if if you're right, Brad, if indeed uh, we aren't going to see any further significant changes then uh, before training camp, then that presumably means then we're looking at prospects uh, trying to crack the lineup or crack being brought up into the lineup uh, from the farm team. Um, on that note, I insisted on uh, writing a piece that I'm sure will embarrass me later. Uh, I actually <laughs> predicted uh, five Flames prospects uh, who could crack the 2021-22 uh, 20, roster. And uh, basically the premise was there's some holes. So the prospects that make it will fill those holes. And I, I said at center, it's a toss up uh, between Adam Ruzicka and Glenn Godden. They'll battle for uh, a centerman spot at right wing. Uh, Matthew Phillips will take on Brett Ritchie for uh, a, a regular spot on left defense. Uh, I've got Connor Mac Mackey uh, up against Oliver Shillington. And then at right defense, I made the case for Johannes Kindal, uh, not terribly well known, a Swedish prospect, uh, edging out um, two journeymen, Nick D. Simone and uh, Andy Walinski. And I said in the press box, you're going to see uh, Mackey and Godden. And then on the 20 man game day roster, Ruzicka and Phillips. Do you guys agree with any of those predictions? Uh, would you put any money on any of them? Uh, Give me Matt Phillips all day long. I love. I want Matt. Yeah. I swear, if Brett Ritchie's in over Matt Phillips this year, I might, I might lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, like honestly, I think you will probably see, you will probably see at least one of those guys in. Like at this, yeah. at this point, I don't know what other option they have. Like, I, I agree with Brett. Like they're probably going to re-sign Michael Stone to shore up that D. But I would sure like to see Connor Mackey in over Michael Stone or pretty much anyone in over Michael Stone, even though he was okay last year. Um, yeah. I yeah. think Godin is, I feel like Godin probably is the most likely given that he's 24. He's a year removed from leading the Heat in scoring. He's probably the most NHL ready, I would say, of the guys there. Like I said, he's already 24. So I feel like Godin is most likely, but my dark horse, like I love Matt Phillips. I don't know how he'd work on a Daryl Sutter team, but. We saw him get into one game last year. He looked really good. He's looked really good. He's 23 now, I believe. Oh, I would love to see Matt Phillips get a shot. Yeah. Well, Greg, you were high on Phillips as well. And and I guess my view of uh, either you you bring him onto the roster, you use him, or you move on from him. What's what's your take, uh, given a choice between Phillips and Richie? I can't I can't believe we're talking about Richie as <laughs> well, uh, they couldn't be more opposite, you know, like Richie and, and Matthew Phillips. Actually, when I started writing for the hockey writers, I did a, a preview piece on the AHL farm team and uh, I kind of got to know the team for the first time, you know, like more in, intensely, and I couldn't, you know, believe that uh you know, like how, how good this little guy is. And I think the only downside is like, I think he's like 150 pounds soaking wet. Like he's, uh, he's maybe the, one of the smaller guys to ever play for the team. I'm thinking because he, he makes Goudreau look, look big. Like I, when I saw him in that 
one game. He's, I thought he looked great. He like, he looked like he was NHL ready. I just don't know. Maybe I agree with Mike a bit, you know, is he like a Daryl Sutter system kind of guy? I really hope he makes it in. Cause I, I have written a couple of articles about Matthew Phillips and um, I'm really hoping that he cracks his roster because, you know, I think the flames need a little bit more, you know, speedy little guy out there who can make plays and, you know, I'm, I'm really a cheerleader for this guy as well. I'm, I'm, he, I'm hoping he makes the team. And I think the only, and, and you know what, I think that Shillington, you know, the fact that they re signed him again, they're, they're giving him another go, you know, like I wouldn't be surprised if he actually made, made this team as well. Cause he, he's, he played, I think um, like 40 games one season, you know, and I think 30 games. Are, he's, he's played a significant amount of games for the flames. And I don't think they'd be keeping, Resigning him to his one year deals, but they didn't think that he had some kind of potential to kind of break out and kind of be a solid, you know, defenseman for them. So, um, so I'm, I'm, those are my two guys that I'm rooting for. I'd really like to see little Matthew Phillips and, and Shillington kind of secure his spot that he's been trying to really get for three seasons now. Brett, last word to you of those guys I had on the uh, list. Would you uh, agree with any of them? Uh, take some off. Add different ones because you you actually wrote a really good piece on the twenty top prospects for the uh, Flames. What's your take? Um, yeah, absolutely, Matthew Phillips. I'll be screaming it from my balcony until they start. You know, I I'd like to see him get an extended look because um, you you go on elite prospects and he's been a point per game player since Double A Bantam and probably all the way down through Timbits Hockey. Uh, and you know, it's first season in the AHL was the first time he wasn't point per game player so he's consistently produced at every level of hockey that he's played and while he's not a point per game player in the AHL he just shows he's got that skill that overcomes his size and like such a good hockey IQ in some of the games I've watched and uh, you know just really really good so I think he's a guy I'd like to see get a look and you know Connor Mackey I think they should try and go with uh a younger D and um, I think that's a guy that's got a shot and same with Shillington. I'd like to see him get that, you know, shot again after just playing eight games last season. Um, so I think those are kind of my three guys. I think the rest, yeah, maybe Glenn Godden makes it. I think Ruzichka needs another year in the A, like a regular year in the AHL and the rest of those guys can spend some time in the minor leagues, but uh, I would say Phillips yeah. and, yeah, uh, Mackey and Shillington are kind of my guys to, you know, make a push for a, a continuous roster spot. I just want to you you mentioned Kinval, uh, Paul. I just wanted to say yeah. a quick word about him. I do think he is an interesting one. I don't see him making the team because he's never played a game of pro hockey over in North America. He's coming right. over for the first time, but he is 24. He has been playing in the Swedish Hockey League against full grown men. He he has experience against like guys who are grown up guys who are NHL size and some NHL skill. He is a right-hand shot D which we all know the team def desperately is lacking in terms of depth. So he is kind of an interesting, like I said, I don't think he's going to make the team at a camp, but he could be an interesting call up later down the year. Probably definitely needs an, a year to get used to the North American game, but he is an interesting name. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll be uh, watching him because as you point out, he, he has, um, well, I wouldn't say lit up the Swedish league, but his numbers are good over there. Yeah, so, for sure. uh, well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately, but as, as always, that was, that was a great discussion and thanks everybody for joining us this week. We'll be back in another two weeks with another edition of the flames face off. And in the meantime, uh, make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. Give us a like and a follow and share this with your fellow Calgary Flames uh, fans. And do be sure to check out the great hockey content that we have here at thehockeywriters.com. Until next time, take care.